Last week we were reading through 1 Peter 1, 13 to 2, 3, and we'll be landing in that text again. And we entitled this message, Now What? And my thinking behind that was, you know, after, after a wedding, after the long engagement period and the wedding, and, and you're sitting, you've come back from the honeymoon and you're sitting now in your, in your apartment, and you're looking around and you're thinking, now what do we do? All the excitement is over, now what do we do? And so last week we said that uh, the Christian life is much like that. When you come to faith, it's very exciting. There's a big rush, there's a big thrill. Uh, you're super zealous at the beginning and then you sort of settle into the Christian life and it's kind of like, now what do you do? Now how do you live the Christian life? And so last week we started in looking at five pursuits for us as believers that will, that will sort of help us to evaluate and prioritize our life. Those things that we value, those things that we, that we invest our time in, how do we determine that? Well, Peter gives us five here in the text in 1 Peter, and so we're going to look at those again this morning. I just wanted to review with you a little bit, and verse 13 in particular, uh, why don't I read the text and then I'll swing back through and we'll, we'll do a little review here, okay? So chapter 1, verse 13 of First Peter, therefore prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address his Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God." Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord." Is a great passage, as we were saying last week, where we're looking at five pursuits that believers can invest themselves in. And if you look back at the text with me there, there's, it's based on five commands that Peter gives here in the text. You see in verse 13 this phrase, fix your hope. Then down in verse 15, be holy. Verse 17, conduct yourselves in fear. Verse 22, fervently love one another. And chapter 2, verse 2, long for the pure milk of the word. This is where we derived our, our outline from here, and you can take a look at that on the back if you've got one of those. I tried to put it up there for you. Uh, hopefully the slides will make sense to you this morning. But a fixed hope is the first one that we, were, that we were alluding to, and there's a couple of reasons why we can have a fixed hope. Uh, it's upon based upon the, the requirements of hope and the reason for hope. And the requirements are that we would in, prepare our minds, that we would actively gird up the loins of our mind. We spoke about that last week. Uh, and that we would fix, uh, that we would keep sober in spirit. These are the requirements of hope. 
the reason for the hope is the revelation of Christ. And so uh, Christ is coming, and we need to be ready for it. That was the point. That is a pursuit for us as believers, is the blessed hope of Christ, that we would fix our mind on that point when Christ is going to return for his church, that we would be sober about it, that we would be prepared for it, and that we would be ready for when he comes. Second pursuit was a holy life. We saw that in verses 14 and 15, and it's plainly obvious there in the text. But two things we said is that our, our relationship to God as his children demands our obedience. Uh, we call him Father, and so there is a necessary requirement that we would obey him as his children. And secondly, we talked about the fact that living obediently to God's will declares our allegiance to him. So we are to live a holy life. So a fixed hope, a holy life. Third, a fearful conduct. We saw that there, verses 17 to 21. And we said last week, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, isn't it? It is a fearful thing. And it's a fearful thing in the text here, he says, to know that we were redeemed um, completely by what God has done for us in the cross of Christ. And we can't contribute anything to that. We can simply rely on what Christ has done in the cross. Uh, secondly, uh, look back at the text again. Also, it's a, it's a fearful thing to rely on what God will do in the future. God will raise us up in the resurrection, and we have no ability to control that. Our only hope is that God will be true to his promise to raise us up. When we get to the great veil of death, that is what will give us hope and encouragement to pass through the veil, is that we know that one day we will be raised and we will see him face to face. So those are the first three. We are going to look at the fourth pursuit and the fifth pursuit this morning, and so I would draw your attention to verses 22 to 25. And the, the fourth pursuit here is a fervent love. And you see that right there in the text, fervently love one another. Now, genuine love for one another is something that should characterize all believers. Would you not say that is true? Uh, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. By what? By your love for one another, right? And we're not talking about the, the feeling of love. We're talking about the willful love of Scripture. We're talking about God's agape love here. Uh, the last living apostle, John, uh, as he was a, an aged man, right, almost as old as Oridenus there, right, what they would do is they would carry him into their gatherings on a mat or on a chair, and they would sit him down, and all he would say is just, my little children love one another. Uh, rumor has it that that is, that is what he would do. He would just keep reiterating, my little children love one another. And it's consistent with his writings, right? 1 John 2, 5, whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. First uh, John 4, 12, no one has beheld God at any time, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us, right? So uh, there is a biblical necessity that we love one another. And there are two prerequisites for gen genuine love that Peter is going to give us here in this text. And the first one is purification. You see that in verse 22? In order for us to love the way we need to, we need to be purified. So what does that mean? Well, he says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So Peter is saying here that, that the idea is since you have uh, been purified, since you were morally purified when you placed faith in the gospel and you obeyed it, you now have the ability and the duty to love one another. It's not that you have to purify yourself. It's that you have been purified. That's the point. He says, you are to love the brethren sincerely, which is the word unhypocritically, not as a hypocrite, 
and fervently, or the idea there is strenuously. Strenuously from the heart or from your affections. That's how we're to love one another. And we know biblically the heart is not the blood pumping organ, right? The heart is that which motivates a person. It's the will, it's the affections, it's the desires, it's the cravings. It's what causes them to do what they do. And Peter says, this is where the love is supposed to come from. The word purified in the text is a perfect, which means that it, it describes a past action with ongoing present results. So what does that mean? Well, in other words, having heard the gospel, which Peter calls the truth, and having obeyed it, their souls were purified. They were purified, and they continue to be purified as they continue to obey it. That's the point. So in other words, I guess what I'm saying is purified is not the command in this text. Purified is something that needs to happen in order to do the command, which is to love one another. Does that make sense? Uh, purified is not the command. It is a command in other places, but, but Peter is saying here that they, they already stand as having been purified, and it's on this basis of their moral purification that they have the ability to love one another the way they ought. They have been purified. Other places, Scripture does tell believers that they have an obligation to remain purified, though. And I don't want to just breeze over that point. Uh, it is commanded in other places. That's not what Peter is after here. But James 4.8 would say, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Right? 1 John 3.3, 3, Everyone who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. And there, again, we see the idea of purification and the fixed hope linked together. You see that? So what's the point? Well, I guess the point is that a mere moral purification should result in brotherly love for one another. That's Peter's point. Uh, it should result in brotherly love. Unfortunately, there is one big obstacle to genuine love in this regard as far as uh, our day and age, and you can probably guess what that is. The biggest obstacle to loving others is loving ourselves, self-love. That's right. So inherent in the purification of the gospel is the idea of dying to self or denial of self. Self-love is what characterizes many today. I have this quote here I'd like to put up. I hope, yeah, I don't know if you can read that or not. Notice the date on this. Can you see the date there? This is from 1828. That's a long time ago. But it was just as much a problem back then as it is today. The essence of man's sin, the sum of his moral depravity, is to love himself supremely to seek himself finally and exclusively, to make self in one shape or another the center to which all his busy thoughts, anxious cares, and diligent pursuits constantly tend. Self-love is the most active and reigning principle in fallen nature. Self is the great idol which mankind is naturally disposed to worship. Boy, is that a true statement for our day and age, is it not? That hits the target. And notice that we're talking about pursuits here, and he says that the center to which all his busy thoughts, anxious cares, and diligent pursuits are is to self. And what we're saying here today is that our, our pursuits should be Christ, uh, God's glory, his word. That's what we should be pursuing, not self. Not self. Uh, this other quote by this man, David Tyler, he wrote a book called The Gospel of Self-Esteem, uh, subtitled, Are We Really Better Than We Think? And he says, Jesus consistently tied together self-denial and the cross. The call of God into the Christian life is a call to self-denial. The cross, self-denial, is the path of every Christian. The antithesis of the cross is self-love. 
Therefore, self-love is classified as a different gospel, according to Galatians 1.6, opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ouch. That hurts. But it is such a reality in our time. What do we hear all the time, right? We need to love ourselves first so that we can love others the way we should, right? We just don't have enough self-esteem. That's what we need. We need more self-esteem. We need to love ourselves a little bit more so that we can love others the way we ought. Now, beloved, the problem is not that we don't love ourselves enough. The problem is that we love ourselves way too much. Way too much. I'm gonna, let me read this working definition of pride here, okay? The mindset of self. A master's mindset rather than that of a servant. A focus on self, the service of self, a pursuit of self-recognition and self-exaltation, a desire to control and use all things for self. Working definition of humility. The mindset of Christ. A servant's mindset. A focus on God and others, a pursuit of the recognition and exaltation of God, and a desire to glorify and please God in all things and by all things he has given. So which one describes you? If you were to put yourself in a category, which one describes you? Let me ask you a second question. You may answer that question. I think I'm more on the humility side. But, but let me ask you a question. Would other people agree with that? Would other people agree with that? Beloved, in order to love God, we need to be purified. In order to love others and love the brethren fervently, we need to be purified. We need to die to self. The second prerequisite for, general, or for genuine love is regeneration. Verses 23 to 25 here. Just start in verse 23. He says, if you have been born again... See that there? Not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and abiding word of God. Uh, Regeneration, the new birth. it's It's a requirement for one to be able to love others as they ought. The word regeneration or born again comes from the Greek word there to beget again. To beget again. Uh, So in order for someone to love as they ought, one must have a renewed heart a renewed sense of affections. They must possess the love of God indwelling their hearts. It's a requirement. See, he says, you have been born again. I would say this is probably better read as having been begat again. That doesn't sound as good, but that's what it's conveying. It's the idea of Uh, They were born again, and they remain in the state of having been born again. It's a past action, present, ongoing results. And the idea here, too, is that it's a passive verb. In other words, they didn't bear themselves. They didn't bear themselves. They didn't walk down an aisle one day and say, today I'm going to be born again. It's something God did to them. He gave them a new heart, new affections. It's God's doing, not theirs. And I guess all that to say this, the point is, uh, since they have been purified and since they have been born again, they now have an obligation and a duty to love the brethren um, fervently from the heart. Uh, These two ideas are requirements, they're necessities. Uh, Without them, it's not going to happen. Fervently in the Greek is the word ektenos, And it means intently, or earnestly, or strenuously. Strenuously. You know where else it's used in Scripture is Luke 22, 44. You remember the scene, Jesus praying in the garden? And great big drops were coming down like blood. He was praying fervently. That's the same word. Uh, It's used also in Acts 12, 5. Peter's in prison, and the church is back praying fervently for Peter's release. So that's the idea that we have behind the word fervently. This is how you're to love one another. 
It's not passive, it's active. You are to fervently seek the best of the other. How do you love others fervently? Many people may ask that question. It's a legitimate question. We demonstrate love through service. Through service. In other words, if you don't have a ministry in the church of God, you're not loving people. You must have a ministry. Uh, Ministry is service to the body. Uh, God and Christ demonstrated their love for the body through their actions, right? John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world. It doesn't mean that he loved it so much. It means this is how he loved it. He gave it his only begotten son, right? Uh, Mark 10.45, the son of man did not come to... to be served, but to what? Serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Believers have been born to something. It's not just that we're born again. It's that we're born again to something. And the idea here is that uh, we have roles and we have responsibilities. We've been born into the body of Christ. Uh, We have roles, we have responsibilities to the body of believers that we need to apprehend and we need to meet. You don't have rights, you have responsibilities. Corporate responsibilities to serve one another and not self. In other words, you don't belong to yourself anymore, you belong to God. You belong to God. Look back at the text with me. I want you to notice the significance of the word of God in the process of this. Importantly, Peter says, uh, this is how they became born again. Uh, by, he's contrasting here the perishable nature of the flesh with the enduring nature of the word. You see that there? And he says, uh, the fleshly seed, the word... Uh, seed here is for us. He says, earthly fathers initiate life with human seed, right? Uh, and it's perishable, it's corruptible. But in contrast to that, God initiates life with the imperishable nature of the Word of God. Uh, natural seeds wither and die eventually. The Word of God lasts unto the age, it does not perish. That's the point of this passage. Very, very strong contrast. You see that in verse 24? All flesh is like grass. Uh, Human seed will die off and wither and fade. But, verse 25, the word of the Lord endures forever. It's imperishable. Imperishable. It's living and it's enduring. Um, These words describe what it means to be imperishable. Uh, The seed of the word of God lives and endures, it does not die off. That's the point. You were born again by something, not by the human seed of your father, which will one day wither and die, but by the eternal word of God, life begets life, and you will continue to live because of that. Back to verse 24. You see what he says? All flesh is like grass, the glory of like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Uh, This is uh, just hammering the nail in here on the idea of the enduring nature of the word of God. It's quoted from Isaiah 40, a combination of verses here, 6 and 8. God's promise of salvation through Christ in Isaiah 40 there. God would comfort his people. He would redeem them by sending the Messiah to redeem them. Uh, Whereas Israel failed, the Messiah would not fail. That's the whole point of Isaiah 40. And it's a proverb. This is a proverb. He says, uh, literally, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of it as a flower of grass, it withered the grass and the flower, it fell off. But the word of the Lord, it remains unto the age. No specific grass in mind here or flower, just grass and flower as an unidentified example. The grass springs up, it flowers, and it dies. 
But in contrast to the word of the Lord, uh, the word of the Lord endures, it abides, it remains unto the age. Emphatically, Peter is saying, this is the one that you heard, and this is the one that you believed, and this is what bore you again unto eternal life. So what am I saying? Why am I saying all this? Well, your ability to love is based on your regeneration. And your regeneration is based upon the living and abiding word of God. You cannot do these things apart from the scriptures. So unless we fully grasp what God has done for us in his word, we cannot fervently love one another. Uh, in the scriptures, we learn who God is and what he is like. Uh, we learn what he has done on our behalf in Christ. Uh, we learn what he will do on our behalf in Christ. Uh, we learn what he has done for all those who call on the name of Christ. And we find out about the love of God in his word. It's used by the Spirit to convict of sin, to renew our minds, to cause us to walk in uprightness and righteousness. And without the Word of God, we're paralyzed. We're paralyzed to change. So two prerequisites to genuine love, purification, regeneration. The final pursuit is a longing for the word. And I want to spend some time on this because if the word is what regenerates us and purifies us, then we ought to be longing for it, is Peter's whole point. We ought to be longing for it. That's why the word therefore is there. And so in this section, Peter is, is using a common New Testament metaphor here, verses 2, uh, chapter 2, 1 through 3 here. It's, it's the idea of an infant growing into maturity. It's the idea of a little baby growing up. And the baby growing up, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, uh, you could look at Hebrews 5, 11 to 14, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. The command here is that believers should have a longing after and a craving for the word of God. It, it should continue to grow them, mature them in the salvation that they have received. Uh, they should have a healthy appetite for the word of God, uh, which will not be satisfied by Christianity light. Christianity light. So as we look at the text this morning, Peter indicates here that there are two keys to maintaining a healthy appetite for the word of God. Two keys. You see those there? Verse 1 putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Stop right there. So the two thoughts of this text are really interrelated to one another. In other words, you, ca you cannot really long after the word of God unless you starve the carnality of your flesh. That's, that's the point. Uh, the first key is that you have to starve the carnality of your flesh. I thought about using the terms purging and binging here, but it didn't feel quite right. <laughs> but essentially, you need to purge yourself from sin, and you need to binge on the Word of God. It is the reality that we're looking at here. He's talking about longing for the Word like milk, like a little baby longing for it. That's what our attitude, our disposition towards the Word of God should be. But he says, in order to do that, you need to put aside. You need to put aside something. You see that? There's two possible meanings here in the context, and I, I just throw them out there for you. One is that it has the idea of undressing. It's a metaphor that you, you take these things off and you put something else on. Uh, the other idea is that it's the idea of cleansing yourself from defilement. So, so uh, putting aside these immoral behaviors, okay? I tend to think it's the latter here. I don't think, I think dressing and undressing is foreign to the context. So that's my choice. You can 
take it or leave it. The tense of the phrase, though, shows the force of the command here. It gives a sense of long for once and for all. A fully and finally, long for it is the idea. I turn to James 1.21. This is not a new concept. The first letter of the New Testament written here, James, he says, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. It's the same thing. It's the, it's the put off, put off the filthiness and the immorality so that you can put on righteousness, or in this case, starve yourself of the immorality so that you can long for and desire the Word of God. I don't know about you guys, but if your mind is defiled and you're thinking sinful thoughts, your desire to be in the Scriptures is usually not going to be there. Am I right? It's usually pretty dry. And so it's not until you stop these behaviors over here and cut them off that you can give the energy and the desire and the affection to the Word of God that should be there. Peter lists five areas of the flesh that need to be starved here. Do you see that? Back in 1 Peter. He says, all malice. The idea here is evil or wickedness. Uh, things that injure brotherly love, if I could say it that way. This is an overall characteristic which all the other areas of the flesh in this verse fit under. It's an umbrella term. Kind of like over in Ephesians 4, the idea of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, malice, slander. They all fit under the word bitterness. Same idea here. All of these fit under malice. And notice he says, put away all malice. Not just some of it, all of it. And he also repeats that, all deceit and deceptiveness. And the word here is dolon, which actually means to, to catch something without bait. Um, it stands in contrast with pure. Uh, when he's speaking about the pure milk of the word, uh, it's talking about the guileless word. In other words, put off infantile deceit and long for the undeceitful word of God. That's the idea. Hypocrisy, it's a translated word, transliterated word. And it's, it's actually connected to to the word deceit. Do you see that? Because notice that the word all is not repeated in between the two words. Uh, they're actually connected to some degree. Uh, deceit is the disposition, whereas hypocrisies are, is the action. Deceit is the disposition. Hypocrisies is the action. Uh, hypocrisy literally means to judge under. Hypo, hypocrisis means to judge under. So in a, in a secular theater, it meant assuming a role of someone behind a mask. Uh, that's the idea of hypocrisy, is, is putting on a face and hiding behind it and judging and being critical of other people. Envy, simply spite or jealousy is the idea here. Spite or jealousy. And notice he says all slander means talking against, insulting others, evil speaking. Uh, the idea here is more the habit of disparagement rather than a one-time open slander. It's, it's a habit. It's an ongoing habit of stabbing people in the back and talking against them. No, what I want to point out to you is notice that all of these uh, take place in a corporate body. You don't, you don't do this sin alone. You sin against people. In other words, you belong to a body of believers. As I said, you've been born to something, and to something means you've been born to the body of Christ. Uh, so uh, these are all sins that lead to divisiveness and destruction of the unity of the body of Christ. These are sins of disunity. They are sins of divisiveness. I think it's ironic that many believers expect to grow in their faith when yet they are really unwilling or in, not incapable, they are just unwilling to abandon their sin issues. They just really don't want to give up their sin even though it's affecting everybody else around them. Peter here says that the two are, they're inseparable. 
They're interrelated. You cannot grow in Christ until you put away the sinfulness. Uh, you need to starve your flesh, and only then will you long for the word as you ought and grow as a result. Uh, only then will the body itself, this body, only then will it grow up into maturity. In other words, denial of self and the desires of the flesh and walking in the Spirit. This is the Galatians 5 issue. If you want to be a doer of the law, then walk in the Spirit. But if you try to keep the law, you'll sin. That's the Galatians 5 principle. And one author said this, the sin that nobody deals with is the sin that everybody deals with. We belong to one another. We are members of one another, and therefore we must long for the pure milk of the word. The second key for a healthy appetite here is to satisfy the cravings of your spirit, verses 2 to 3. You see that there? Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So once the fleshly vices have been starved and, and they are deprived of their power in your life, uh, then longing for God's word will increase. Only then will it increase. It is proportional. The idea here is infants. And newborn babies is infants. And uh, you're to be like a child who is nursing. Like a nursing child. You ladies know what I'm talking about when kid gets hungry. I remember my wife used to leave me with, with our son and she would, I would give her some time away and, and then as soon as she walked out the door, he'd be hungry. It, it just, it always happened. He'd, she'd walk out the door and he'd start crying for milk. Uh, that's, nothing would satisfy him. Nothing I did. I could run the vacuum cleaner, you know walk around with him, pat his back. Nothing would satisfy him. He had to have, he had to have, he had to be fed again. These are more than likely, you should know this, not new converts that we're talking about here. These are not new converts. Uh, these are mature believers, and Peter is still exhorting them that they should have an intense, ever-recurring desire for the Word of God like like a baby for milk. Uh, the command here to long for means, it means to crave, it means to desire. Uh, and the word pure is actually a combination of words. They tried to smooth it out for you from the Greek. Uh, it, it literally means spiritual and guileless is the idea here. It's, it's uh, spiritual milk, it's guileless milk, it's, uh, it's the... It's the right stuff, I guess. I don't know how else to say it. There's a couple of reasons why your spirit, uh, why you should long for the Word of God. Uh, first, your spirit needs nourishment, right? Your spirit needs it. If you're not in the Word, I mean, you will just wither and die. It's pretty hard to live as a believer apart from God's Word. Notice that he says, uh, so that in it you may grow in salvation. You see that? And this is a purpose clause. And notice the little phrase, in it. In it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Apart from it, the, the reverse is true. You will not grow. You will not grow. Emphatically, Peter is saying the nourishment that is needed to grow to maturity comes from the Word of God. Nowhere else. In it, we will grow in salvation. In this context, the word grow up, it carries the idea of being nourished up, uh, built up in your strength, uh, power aids or whatever, the monsters, I guess. The Word of God is the monster that we need to, to get us nourished up. I, I am amazed that Christianity is surviving on Hershey bars now. You know, the, the Word of God is, 
secondary, I was uh, speaking uh, to a friend and they were telling me that I was asking them, well, how long does your pastor preach at your church? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. How does somebody survive on a Hershey bar? We need, we need meat, right? We need the meat of the Word of God. You're not going to survive on Hershey bars. The second reason, your spirit knows Christ. He says, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord here. Uh, normally, the Lord refers to God the Father, but here it's a reference to Christ the Lord. And this is just an affirmation that they have come to know Christ. It's a, it's a first-class condition, which means that it, it should be taken as since, since you have tasted. And it's a, just a simple, undefined past action. Uh, you taste it. Uh, the point is that these are believers. These are believers. They're not unbelievers. And it's not the idea here that it's encouraging uh, believers to somehow grow in grace because the uh, first taste tasted good. It's the idea that now that they have begun to grow in grace, they should keep on growing in grace. The word kindness here is, is uh, used in the Old Testament for God's loving kindness. You've heard that word, right? It's chesed. It's God's covenant love for his people. You have tasted the kindness of the Lord. I guess as I think about it, I would just say this, that nourishment comes from the Word of God. And I would just, I'm amazed, I guess I shouldn't be, but I am, I'm amazed at how many believers tell me they are struggling in their faith, and I ask them one question, are you reading your Bible? And what do you think they tell me? No. No, I'm not. Well, how do you expect to be nourished and to grow if you're not reading your Bible. You simply cannot expect to grow as a believer apart from it. You cannot grow without the milk that you need. And notice that he uses the word salvation. Grow in respect to your salvation. You see that? Salvation is a key term in the book. Uh, salvation in light of suffering uh, this whole letter is about the church suffering, right? And so these five principles here, <clears throat> Peter is encouraging them to do these in the midst of suffering. Uh, I'm just telling you to do them as part of regular life, but imagine if you were being persecuted, how important these things would become to you. Uh, bigger picture here, how to live as a believer under not so great conditions. And that's what Peter is telling them. Uh, you simply cannot expect to grow as a believer or grow in respect to your salvation apart from the Word of God. If you're not longing after it, uh, then perhaps something else is occupying that place in your affections. Maybe something else has got a grip on your soul. But it should be the Scriptures. It should be the Scriptures. Now, ironically, as I was thinking about this, you know, some believers do just the opposite. They, they starve themselves from the Word of God and then, and then binge on their fleshly appetites. They do just the opposite. Others, uh, they sort of do this thing where they binge and purge on the Word of God. They, they read it, like, really strong for a day or two and then, like, nothing for months at a time. They indulge themselves on the word for a moment, and then it's gone in an instant. It's like a flash. And I guess the point here is that Peter is saying, uh, babies don't just eat once for the week, and then not eat again for three weeks, right? What do babies do? They crave all day, every day, for the word of God. They keep indulging in it. They feast as long as you'll let them. Because they, they're not satisfied by anything else. And that's the perspective that we need to have as believers. We need to starve the carnality of our flesh so that we will satisfy the cravings of our spirit. So two keys for longing the pure milk of the word of God. 
You know, there are many things that compete for our attention. As believers, we need to evaluate, determine our priorities in life, right? What is competing for your attention? If you are going to give yourself to something, then I would suggest you give yourself to these five things. A fixed hope, a holy life, a fearful conduct, a fervent love, and a longing for the word. You know, in an age of distractions, these are worthwhile pursuits for all of us. Let's pray. Our Father, we do pray that you would give us a fervent love for one another this morning. Our Father, we want others to know Christ and to know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. And we pray that we would go simply beyond just a casual acquaintances, but that, Father, we would give ourselves uh, to the relationships that you have placed us in within the body of Christ. And we know that we can't do this, our Father, unless we starve out our own desires and our own, our own preferences. Father, help us also to long after the Word of God. We want to give ourselves to it, and so we pray you would help us to attack and kill the sin, uh, lest it be killing us. Father, we want to do away with the sin that so easily entangles us and causes division and disunity. And we want to give ourselves, our Father, to the pure milk of the Word. We want to long after it. Father, all of these things, uh, the fixed hope, the holy life, the fearful conduct, the the longing for the pure milk of the word, the fervently loving one another, we can only do these things so much as your spirit enables us to do it. Our Father, we, if we were to do these things in the flesh, we would only fail. So we need your spirit, Father. We ask you for your spirit. Please help us to think on these things throughout the week and to not just be Sunday Christians, but Christians who long for the word throughout the week. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen.